Hi. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, so, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about our work on uh, enabling robustness power trade-offs on computational eyeglasses. Um, as I said, this is work with my advisor, Deepak Ganesan, at the University of Massachusetts, along with uh, a number of other collaborators. Uh, so just really briefly, I'm going to introduce the concept of computational eyeglass. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, it's the same idea as a smartwatch. Uh, so you have something that people already wear, in this case eyeglasses, uh, that's ubiquitous. And uh, you just simply add computation and sensing uh, to be able to sense and to um, do meaningful things with the data. Uh, the immediate follow-up question that I want to address is, well, why bother doing it? Um, and there's actually a lot of really good answers to that question that different groups and different uh, industries are exploring. But what I want to focus on is that it allows us to do continuous monitoring of the eye, uh, of a person's eye. So the re there are a lot of implications for that in health and in uh, safety applications. Uh, so I'm going to go through a few really quickly. Um, in terms of health, uh, dyslexia is one interesting example. Um, dyslexic individuals have very distinctive eye movement patterns when presented with a visual task like reading or, uh, in this case, solving a maze. So what you're looking at are eye tracks, um, eye movement tracks is of the person trying to go through this maze. Uh, the blue is the track of someone who doesn't have dyslexia and the red is with dyslexia. So you, you could use eye tracking to identify it and possibly uh, help individuals with these kind of tasks. Another one uh, is fatigue. It's well known. Uh, they're really well known measures for using blinks and uh, features of the eye to figure out how tired someone is. So if someone is doing something that they cannot do safely while tired, such as uh, operating heavy machinery, uh, you could diagnose and warn them with a system like this. Uh, and the last one I'm going to talk about is uh, tension and cognition. Um, and the simple idea is that um, pupil dilation tells you a little bit about how hard someone's thinking about what they're doing or how much they're paying attention to it. So you could use it, for example, with students um, to see and research how much they're engaging with different kinds of material and use that to restructure how you present things. But the overall point with all this is that um, we believe that computational eyeglasses can enable us to kind of get at the state of the person's mind without having to do something like an EEG. Um, it's something on glasses that they already wear, and we can get a lot of meaningful information from that. So this isn't a new idea. Um, I'm sure most of you know. Um, in the industry side, a lot of companies have been doing really good work, and SMI, Tobi, and others have done several generations of devices like this. Um, on the academic side, you've seen a couple pop up in the last few years. Um, last year alone, here at Mobicom, we saw the iGaze project, um, and then our group's work, um, iShadow, appeared at Mobisys last year. Um, but, so these systems exist, but um, one of the big questions with anything like this is how practical is it? And since we're talking about wearables, for most of us, the first question is how much power does it consume for very obvious reasons? So the industrial devices um, usually consume on the order of several watts. Um, uh, the iGaze um, project, that group reported about a watt of power consumption. With iShadow, we reported about 70 milliwatts, um, give or take which sounds good compared to especially the industrial trackers, but then you compare it to wearables that have already achieved really good market penetration and are actually commonly worn by people, like the Fitbit One uh, comes in at a milliwatt, and other similar devices are similar order of magnitude. So there's a, a ways to go still before we achieve realistic levels of power consumption to be on par with other wearables. And the story gets even a little more complicated when we talk about um, accuracy, and the accuracy I'm referring to specifically is eye tracking accuracy, which is um, how incorrect are you um, when measuring the position of someone's eye. And we usually measure this in degrees. Uh, this is where industrial trackers went out. They usually have about a tenth of a degree of error. Eye gaze, eye shadow, five, three degrees of error, respectively. So we've set ourselves up if we want to move forward with this kind of technology, with the kind of interesting problem of we want to increase accuracy while decreasing power. And we want to do both kind of drastically. Um, and as everyone in this room is aware, these two goals are usually competing. But um, <clears throat> to understand the challenges involved and our method for tackling it, I want to talk really quickly about um, the different eye tracking techniques that these kinds of devices use. So traditional regime um, is very straightforward. You have nowadays high definition cameras, very good images of the eye. Um, so you get a high definition video stream at 30 to 60 frames per second usually. You offload that to a storage device or to an Android phone these days. Um, and then from there, they have a complex model of the eye 
uh, with a lot of like calibration points and things like that, and they're able to fit that model to the video and get very, very good tracking results. With eyeshadow, um, when we started working on it, one of the things we noted was that um, a lot of the cost in the traditional eye tracking model comes from the, uh, the cost of accessing all these pixels. You have millions and millions of pixels that you're accessing at relatively high rates, and each pixel incurs a cost for digitization for an ADC or something of that nature, and also for processing, even if you're not doing much with it when there's so many. Um, and so what we did was we built a sparsely sampling neural network to reduce the number of pixels we actually use in the image in order to cut down on that massive amount of power consumption. Um, and again, the goal being reducing power for the overall system whilst not sacrificing accuracy as much as possible. Uh, and the way we did that really quickly with the neural network was we just minimize, um, we use a standard regularization equation, and we minimize these two objectives here, the uh, gaze error and then the, uh, the, spar uh, the sparsity of the pixels. We want to increase sparsity as much as possible so as to reduce power. And we have a tuning parameter that will come up again later uh, that allows you to trade off against the two. And all of this is still lightweight enough that we were able to run it in real time on an, a microcontroller that we can mount on glasses. So we're sticking with that goal of keeping it unobtrusive. Uh, so just to recap really quickly, traditional method, full image sampling, high power, excellent accuracy. Uh, eyeshadow, much lower power, orders of magnitude, but also orders of magnitude higher error. So moving forward, what we want is to bring down the power below 10 milliwatts and, in, and bring the accuracy, excuse me, back up to levels that are comparable to industrial trackers. And the way we pursued that is by pushing the sparse sampling down even further to further decrease power, but then doing it in a more targeted way, focusing on the most salient eye features um, which we determined to be those around the, the iris and the pupil, because those, if you know where they are, will give you all the information you need. So, step by step of how we approach this, um, this is an image taken from the original eyeshadow platform, and it's immediately obvious the m big reasons why we were having accuracy problems. It's a, we were using low power embedded cameras that have some other really nice properties, but very noisy images, grayscale images. Um, and on top of that, we're subsampling from noisy images, so it's only going to get worse. Um, so that accounts for most of our error. So there's a well-known solution for this in the eye tracking community, and that's to use near-infrared or NIR illumination. You just add some near-infrared LEDs. Uh, the reason we didn't do this in the original eyeshadow platform is because these have obviously a, uh, usually a non-negligible power cost. A lot of times they'll use six or eight per eye, uh, and so you're getting up into the hundreds of milliwatts range at that point. Uh, we did some experimentation and figured out that you can actually get a good quality image, as you see here, with only one or two LEDs, relatively low voltage, duty cycled, and you don't incur a meaningful power cost. It's less than a milliwatt, significantly less than a milliwatt in most cases. Um, and you get a massive increase in image quality. And on top of that, you, uh, near infrared has this really nice property that it brings out the contrast in the eye images. Uh, so you can see the pupil very clearly. Uh, so once we've got these nice eye features, the next question is, oops, sorry, uh, uh, we need a tracking algorithm to take advantage of it. Um, so we have nice images now, and suppose actually we don't even start with an image. We start with, uh, we have a probability, probabilistic, excuse me, idea of where the pupil is in the, um, uh, in the image plane. And so we've represented it here as a point cloud, and the most, um, remembering that we want to, sample the minimum number of pixels we can get away with, the most efficient way we figured out to figure out where the pupil is in this image is to sample a single row and a single column from the imager, just ask it for only those pixels, um, which when we do that on this image, you can see here what we get, uh, because our estimate was a little bit off, we didn't get right in the middle of the pupil, you can kind of see these areas here, but we got close enough, we, did, we touched it with both the row and the column, and as it turns out, it's actually enough to give us all the information we care about. Um, so let me run through really quickly how that works. Uh, so first you filter the row and the column um, to remove some of the noise. Then you do edge detection to find those nice eye features that the NIR brings out. And then lastly, once you've divided up into regions, you just label them according to the parts of the eye you're looking for. So the white, the iris, the pupil, and so on and so forth. You can see here on the left-hand side. Once you've done this through the row and the column, you now have cords um, uh, across the circle of the pupil and that gives you four points on the edge, which is enough to compute to the center, x, y, and the radius. 
Um, and actually, you have only three unknowns that you need. So the fourth one allows us, uh, gives us some redundant information. So it allows us to do an internal validity check, like a sanity check, if you will, to make sure that what we found actually fits the shape that we expect. Uh, and so once you've done the computation, you generate an estimate of where the eye is and its size. Uh, and size, again, is important because that tells you dilation, and that's relevant for a lot of the um, uh, cognition metrics. And hopefully, as we did here, you get a good estimate, and that is the entire technique. Uh, so we refer to this as the cross model because it's just the intersecting right angle row and column. And one of the nice properties there we go, is that um, uh, the cross model has this implicit ability to track the eye by just feeding forward the um, uh, previous or the uh, existing eye center estimate. So you get an updated estimate, you start your next search at that point, and then you just keep updating it. And under most situations, you can track the eye as you're seeing here. So Obviously, there are some caveats to that. If, you ever, if there's a blink or some kind of artifact, you're going to lose track of the eye. Um, and this really doesn't have any mechanism for getting back on track. So to deal with that, and also to deal with the fact that the cross model needs a, to be bootstrapped, it means like an initial estimate, um, uh, we developed the core algorithm, uh, CIDR, Circular Detection of Edges with Reinforcement. Um, and this is a simple search refine controller. Most systems programmers should be familiar with this. Um, so the search stage, the stage that initializes the pipeline, is the original neural network model we were using before. So it takes some pixels from the image, um, and then it generates an estimate of the pupil, which we pass into the refine stage, which is the cross model. Um, I just want to highlight here, we need to be in the cross model as much as possible because it's much lower power, far fewer pixels, and it's also actually more accurate than the neural network because we're using these explicit eye features. Now, the cross model can miss due to the issues I mentioned before, and when that internal validity check fails, it drops back to the neural network and reboots. Uh, this is what we mean by reinforcement. The neural network reinforces the cross model. Most of the time, though, um, we figured out empirically most of the time uh, that the cross model works. Um, from it, we're able to calculate the center and the dilation, as I mentioned, and then you just feed forward and continue tracking for, uh, until you have a blink or similar artifact. Um, so the CIDR algorithm helps, um, uses the neural network and the cross model together to leverage the strengths of both and deliver a robust, accurate algorithm at low power. One other hang-up, anyone who's worked with infrared or eye tracking is, will be aware of this, that um, uh, when you step outdoors, you're in a new scenario. So the general use case we're looking at is people in indoor environments doing work or interacting with other people. Um, but we want to be able to deal with the outdoor case. And the reason it's a separate case is because there's basically no infrared emitted by artificial lighting, whereas the sun emits more, about twice as much infrared as optical energy. So what happens is it overwhelms our camera, can't see the eye anymore, you can't see the eye, you can't track the eye. So to deal with this, it was relatively straightforward. Um, to begin with, we added an, an IR photodiode uh, that is configured to detect infrared, and then we lower the camera gain to make the pixels less sensitive. Uh, so we've recovered, we can recover an image of the eye now. Um, oh, and I should mention it's very easy to tell the difference between indoors and outdoors with a hard threshold because the difference in energy is so drastic. Um, but now, because reducing the gain necessarily kills the contrast, the refined stage, the cross model, doesn't have the nice features it's looking for anymore. Um, so what we do is, we figured out that the neural network can still handle the, um, these lower quality images, so we train a new neural network with outdoor images, and then we switch over to that one when we're outside, use only that and not the cross model. Um, so it incurs some higher power, but um, we get robustness and the ability to be outdoors and eye tracking. Uh, really briefly, this is a picture of the platform. I've got one with me here if anyone wants to see afterwards. Um, the highlights are things I mentioned already, the cameras, um, the photodiode, and the LEDs. Um, I have a little bit here around starting a new user. I'm actually just going to move through this really quickly for time. But uh, the big takeaway is um, the calibration process for most eye tracking devices is kind of onerous on the person whose eye is being tracked. You have to do some calibration stuff, have them do some tasks to get the data you need. We don't have that. Um, we just, you can put it on them, let them go about their day, record, uh, label it, and then put the glasses right back on them and, allow, and begin eye tracking. 
<laughs> so uh, experiments we did to evaluate. Um, we did several. Uh, some are smaller ones were only in the paper, are not listed here. Um, so the first two are very similar. These are the big ones, about 15 subjects, about five minutes of video of the eye per subject. Um, the task was just to, just to force eye movement, was to them watching an LCD screen with a target moving around on it. Um, the only difference between the two experiments is in the second one, we turned the lights up and down to force the pupil to dilate to prove that we, our system still works when the appearance of the eye is changing. And the last experiment was just to prove uh, that the system works in outdoor environments. Um, yeah, so I'm only going to discuss. Actually, let me go back. I'm only going to discuss results from the first experiment for time, um, but I'm happy to talk to you or refer to the paper for others. Um, really briefly, this is our major result, um, which is comparing the accuracy and um, the accuracy power trade-off of CIDR versus just using the neural network. Um, so on this plot, obviously the ideal is zero power, zero error. It's not really feasible, but um, CIDR outperforms the neural network, um, better performance per power in every way. And um, at the performance elbow here, in our measurements, it consumes about seven milliwatts, and you're getting about four or five tenths of a degree of error. Um, another quick thing I want to touch on is um, rate versus power. These are inherently linked in our system because if you want to conserve power, you just duty cycle and run at a lower rate. So in that case, you're running at like four hertz for about seven milliwatts. Um, at the high end, we can do up to 200 plus hertz, um, and you're still only incurring a cost of 30 to 40 milliwatts. Uh, so in conclusion, we introduced CIDR, which is a regime for improving the tracking accuracy and power consumption of computational eyeglasses. Um, we have some good um, measurements on it. It's robust to outdoor environments. Um, and we're looking at lowering the form factor and dealing with some of the um, tracking issues that come up when it's actually on a person. So really quickly, I'm going to do a demo. Are there any, are there any new grad students in the room? You should watch carefully what's about to happen and make sure you never do this because it's a bad idea. And I'm brutally aware that these things are not at all attractive. But Okay. So what you're looking at, and I apologize for the low contrast, um, but what you're looking at is my eye, and you can see the pupil here, and the blue is the subsampled row and column. The green is the center of the pupil, or the area of the pupil, and the red is the center. So you can see that occasionally it loses track, like if I close my eye and the neural network jumps in and can't really figure anything out, um, but when I open my eye again, the neural network recenters it and it can begin tracking and I can't really see anymore. Uh, so I'm going to hope that it's doing well because I can't see and I'm going to stop now. <laughs> um,